in this module we are going to go a little further in our discussion of atomic structure. So far we have studied black body radiation and we have seen how Planck uh, distribution uh, explained the black body radiation nicely in long wavelength regime as well as short wavelength regime and how uh, it led to this very important uh, understanding that energy has to be quantized. This was a revolutionary idea and this is what laid the foundation of quantum mechanics. The name quantum itself comes from here, quantum means a packet. So with this background and knowing that Rutherford model did not really work because classical mechanics requires it to give out requires the atom to give out energy continuously, electron to give out energy continuously and therefore spiral onto the nucleus and also with another experimental result that is atomic spectra, Bohr formulated his model. What you see here is a collection of emission spectra of several atoms and uh, the, it is depicted here in the classical way. What you can think is you have this uh, source the emitter light that is emitted falls on a grating or a prism which disperses the light and that falls on a uh, photographic plate. So different regions of the photographic plate have uh, record intensities of different light. So this is how uh, spectra would look like in that, an arra that arrangement. The color has been added uh, to uh, make us understand the color in more reality but actually these are all black and white photographs. Here you can think x axis is your uh, wavelength and wherever we see a line that is where uh, that is the energy or wavelength corresponding to which emission has taken place. Now see if Rutherford model was correct then what we should see is a continuum something like the top panel we do not see that. Depending on which atom you look at you see lines and in fact you see some series of lines this is something that was known by the time uh, Rutherford proposed his theory. Now, even before a theoretical uh, formulation to explain this was worked out, experimentally looking at the energies where the emissions take place for different atoms, an empirical formula was already there. And this empirical formula uh, was called the Rydberg formula. It is based on the Rydberg Ritz combination principle that states that the spectral lines of any element include frequencies that are either the sum or difference of frequencies of two other lines. And what it boils down to is that if you take 1 by lambda wave number that is equal to a constant multiplied by 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square where n1 and n2 are two positive integers. This constant r is called Rydberg constant and the value of Rydberg constant was found to be 1.09678 into 10 to the power 7 per meter. Now it might sound ridiculous, so, so many decimal points are there. Generally when a student reports data like this we always ask that uh, are you sure that uh, your answer is correct to the last place of decimal that you have reported. Rydberg was sure, it experiment was done many many times and it was found that we do have accuracy until that many places of decimal. So Rydberg constant was acclaimed as the most accurately measured fundamental physical constant. Okay. So this is known and uh, different series of lines were observed and mainly we will focus on hydrogen emission spectrum, uh, the 5 series of lines that were found were Lyman, Balmer, Paschen, Bracket, Fund. And for each of these this N1 was constant and N2 varied. Balmer series was the one that was observed 
uh, first because as you see the values 410 nanometer, 434 nanometer, 486 nanometer, 656 nanometer these are all in visible region. So, they were observed by the eye, but then other lines were observed in other uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, this is something that was known and uh, as Max Planck put it experimental results are the only truth. He went on to say everything else is poetry and imagination. But of course, one should not undermine poetry and imagination that is what sets human beings apart from other animals. So, what Planck did is that he said that experimentally since we see this, this has to be correct, you cannot challenge it. So, uh, your theory should be such that should match it and this is where Bohr came in. So, what Bohr said essentially is that uh, I do not know why and I do not care, but from the atomic spectra it is quite obvious that electrons reside in specific orbits. The radius of the orbit cannot be just anything, it has to be specific, certain specific orbits are allowed and Bohr sort of said I do not know why and I do not need to why this is the, uh, this is the truth that is how it is. And also what he worked out was that these allowed orbits were those in which mvr equal to nh by 2 pi. Angular momentum is an integral multiple of h by 2 pi. Now, the h by 2 pi is often written as h cross and uh, turns out to be the most fundamental entity in quantum mechanics. You will see everything uh, that is like angular momentum would be an integral multiple of this. We will come to several examples later on. Why is it there? Later on when we get into the wave nature one can sort of find a justification of why MVR has to be an integral multiple of h by 2 pi because that is the only condition that leads to constructive interference of the waves, but let that be the story for another day. So, using uh, this, so he said that electron cannot reside in any space in between. So, MVR equal to nh by 2 pi are the only r values that are supported that are allowed and then when an electron jumps from one such allowed orbit to another or allowed orbit, energy difference between these two orbits is either emitted or absorbed depending on the relative energies of the orbits. And these were given a name by Bohr, these were called stationary states and it is important to understand this term because this term is used even now in the most modern approach of quantum mechanics. When we say stationary states, we do not mean that the electron is stationary. According to Bohr model of course, it cannot be, it is moving in circles. What we mean is that the energy does not change, stationary as far as energy is concerned, not as far as station, as uh, position is concerned, stationary states. So, an electron can only reside in stationary states or allowed orbits where MVR equal to NH by 2 pi when it jumps from one stationary state to the other the difference in energy of the stationary states is either emitted or absorbed uh, as light depending on uh, which energy state is higher and which energy state is lower in energy. Okay. Using this and it is a pity that we are not going to uh, go into the detail of this uh, discussion here because well, precisely because that uh, we do not really use Bohr model anymore, but whoever is interested can look up uh, say classical mechanics books and look up Bohr's papers maybe and uh, books which have discuss Bohr theory in detail. Bohr did a fairly simple uh, calculation using the tools of classical mechanics. And those tools of classical mechanics are essentially things like algebra and more importantly calculus. So, using calculus what one can work out from Bohr's theory is the energy. The energy expression that we get is E n. Now, remember only certain levels are allowed. So, you cannot talk about a continuous 
uh, distribution of energies. So, E n is equal to m e multiplied by u to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon 0 square h square into 1 by n square. This is the energy expression and this is what takes us directly to uh, the Slidberg constant because the lines that we see in the spectra, the lines that are whose energies are given by Rydberg equation essentially come as a result of the electron jumping from one stationary state to the other according to Bohr. So, it is going to be this constant multiplied by 1 by n, n 1 square minus 1 by n 2 square Rydberg formula. We will come back to it. Also what uh, Bohr could do is that Bohr could work out a precise expression for the radius that we are not showing here. So, precision and expression of the I mean precise uh, values of all these things is the hallmark of Bohr theory and as we will come to later on this is both the strength and the weakness of the theory. But now let, is, let me just uh, say what I actually said without showing you the uh, formula here from the energy expression one can easily work out the energies of the spectral lines and it comes out to be this m e e to the power 4 by 8 epsilon square h square multiplied by 1 by n 1 square minus 1 by n 2 square that will be equal to h nu, h nu is h c by lambda. So, 1 by lambda would be this expression multiplied by c h and from there one can uh, obtain a theoretical value of Rydberg constant and the value that we get is 1.09678 into 10 to the minus 2 per nanometer is precisely the same value that is obtained experimentally. That is the strength of both theory that we have this experimentally observed quantity which is so precise both theory can give you that value to the last decimal place. Also one can work out the ionization potential for hydrogen atom and the experimental value of 13.6 electron volt is reproduced very nicely using Bohr theory. So, success of Bohr theory is that it <coughs> can give you very precise values of physical quantities associated with hydrogen atom. The problem with Bohr theory is that it does not work beyond the hydrogen atom. In fact, even in hydrogen atom if one tries to look a little closer it turns out that Bohr theory has to be extended. And this extension was done mainly by Sommerfeld. In fact, there are there is a series of papers published by Sommerfeld where he sort of discusses Bohr's theory and <coughs> proposes how it can be extended so that it can observe more experimental observation uh, so that it can explain more experimental observations. So, the first extension was necessitated by the fact that with advent of better spectrometers it was found that what was thought to be one line in part, a particular atomic spectra was not one line. Sometimes it was two lines, sometimes it was three lines. So, it appeared that there are sub levels of energy. To account for that, to account for this what is called spectral fine structure, Sommerfeld invoked the, the concept of elliptical orbits elliptical orbits with uh, so like this what he said is that for every value of n you have a series of elliptical orbits a special case of which is a circular orbit. And what he said that uh, now one quantum number is not enough you have to specify n for the entire set and what was proposed was k now in modern days we say l, l is just k minus 1. So, this quantum number k was proposed for n equal to 4 it was observed that k can take up values of 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now, we say l can take up values of 0, 1, 2 and 3. So, total number of k or l quantum numbers which are called many things secondary quantum numbers, subsidiary quantum numbers, azimuthal quantum numbers 
y azimuthal we will come to that when we talk about wave mechanics. So, these uh, sets of orbits have energies that are close to each other, but they are still a little different from each other and what Sommerfeld proposed was that uh, this difference in energy comes from the eccentricity of the ellipse. And again looking at experimental results it was also understood that for a given value of n one can have n values of k and these values were designated uh, <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4 so on and so forth up to n. Now we all know about S, P, D and F, S, P, D and F uh, well the letters came from uh, for historical reasons they came from spectroscopic observations S means sharp, D means diffuse and so on and so forth. So, those names were assigned to some of the uh, small k values. So, this is how the subsidiary or secondary or azimuthal quantum number came. Next uh, came Zeeman effect. It was known that uh, upon placing the emitter, emitter atoms in a magnetic field the line split and the number of lines in the spectrum increased. Why so? From Zeeman effect and also it is split in a particular way. So, from Zeeman effect the idea that came is that uh, for a given elliptical orbit let us say k equal to 2 in k equal to 2 in the diagram that we have shown here there can be several sub orbits. How many uh, sub or well not sub orbit sorry actually k equal to 2 is not one elliptical orbit there is more than one for which n is the same k is the same. So, uh, the elliptic the eccentricity is the same what is different than orientation it was proposed that for every value of well now I will say l not k l is a little easier for every value of l there are 2l plus 1 number of orientations that the orbits can exist in. So, for L equal to 1 you can have this orientation or this or this. What that leads to is that if you think of electron going around in a circle roughly then the angular momentum is going to point uh, going to be a normal to the plane of rotation. So, if this is the plane of rotation this is the direction of angular momentum. So, what it says essentially Zeeman effect is that for say L equal to 1 you can have an orbit pointing in in this direction so that the angular momentum points in this direction or in this direction or in this direction. This is called space quantization. Not only is energy quantized or angular momentum quantized space is also quantized in the sense that the orbits can be oriented in specific directions or if we want to use a term that uh, survives even beyond uh, uh, Bohr model the angular momentum vector can be oriented only in specific directions. This is what it means. So, what is shown here is what happens when L is equal to 2 when L is equal to 2 12 plus 1 equal to 5. So, first of all uh, one thing I forgot to say a little earlier is that the angular momentum itself is given by square root of L into L plus 1 multiplied by H cross. So, when L equal to 2 the length of this arrow that is the angular momentum is going to be square root of 6 multiplied by h cross square root of 2 into 3 right L into L plus 1 and it can take up 2 L plus 1 that is 5 orientations and corresponding to each what, what is different is the z component of the angular momentum. So, actually m stands for z component of angular momentum even in Bohr model. Later on what we will see is that we are going to forsake the orbits, but we are going to retain the angular momentum vector and its uh, specific orientations that it can take up. So, that led to a third quantum number magnetic quantum number m and in fact this model of these elliptical orbits oriented in specific directions gave rise to one of the uh, most popular widely used motifs that we see in many places to depict atoms and this is that figure. What it shows here is a central nucleus 
and 3 orbits around it in specific directions. Even now in many places uh, this is sort of used as a cartoon for the atom even though this model is discarded. In fact, you can see this motif in the logo of our Department of Atomic Energy of India DAE. Uh, this is what the present logo of DAE looks like. Here also you can see nucleus and many different orbits. So, this L value is rather high that is why we have many M values uh, that is what is shown as a motif in the logo of Department of Atomic Energy of India. So, we got 3 quantum numbers N tells you about the energy, L small changes in energy and mostly angular momentum root over L into L plus 1 multiplied by H cross is angular momentum and M tells you about the orientation of the orbit or orientation of the angular momentum vector whichever way you want to put it. Eventually we are only going to talk about uh, orientation of angular momentum vector. Right. There is a fourth quantum number spin which arises from a completely different experiment and that experiment we will discuss uh, shortly. So, let us take a rain check on that. So, in, in all there are four quantum numbers that one requires to uh, specify the uh, what we can say address of an electron in an atom. Okay. So, all this is great, but then Bohr theory uh, faced severe criticism. First criticism was that it uses classical theory and quantum theory arbitrarily wherever quantum uh, classical theory works calculus can be used it is used extensively. And then when it does not work it is dumped unceremoniously and resort is taken to the uh, newly found quantum theory. So, uh, that did not really go down well with uh, the scientific community. It, it was felt that it is a very sort of opportunistic theory. It uh, says whatever is convenient whenever it is convenient. But one could perhaps live with that given the uh, accurate values that are predicted by Bohr's theory. The death knell came in the uh, in this uh, specialization of Bohr theory in finding everything accurately. From Bohr theory you can find radius which tells you the position and you can also find the momentum. The problem is this uncertainty principle came which said that you cannot determine conjugate properties like position and momentum simultaneously with any great accuracy. Uncertainty principle says uh, delta x multiplied by delta p x has to be greater than h by 4 pi. And this uncertainty principle is important to understand is not something that can be circumvented uh, by making a better instrument. The subsidiary quantum number for example came due to the advent of better spectrometers. Uncertainty, uncertainty principle has nothing to do with instruments. It is the limit beyond which nature does not let us probe it. And we will understand it better when we talk about uh, when we discuss uh, a little bit of Schrodinger equation. But at this time perhaps we can uh, discuss a thought experiment that was proposed by Einstein. The thought experiment is suppose I want to locate an electron, I want to know exactly where it is. What will I do? I will put it under a microscope and I will shine light so that I can see the electron. The problem is uh, for electron this energy of the photon light is enough to change its momentum. And in fact, when momentum is changed position will also change quickly. So, that is why one cannot determine these two simultaneously, it is nothing to do with the instrument. And later on we will see that uh, when we talk about wave mechanics, a sine wave or a cosine wave is something that is associated with a specific value of momentum. But if you look at sine wave, where is if, if this sine wave stands for a particle, where is the particle? It can be anywhere from plus in minus infinity to plus infinity. So, uh, the issue is that your uh, if you mix sine waves then what happens? 
If you mix a large number of waves what will happen is at some point there will be a strong uh, constructive interference and then as you go to the two sides there will be destructive interference. So, uh, the wave will die off. If you mix a high number of wave well this is called a wave packet. If your wave packet consists of a large number of waves then there will be a situation where uh, there will be a high uh, degree of location, but then you have obtained it by mixing many waves right. So, uh, there is no way you can tell what the momentum actually is, but we will come back to this issue a little later. For now let us just take it maybe axiomatically that uncertainty principle is something that one cannot violate and Bohr's theory tries to do precisely that. It tries to determine position and momentum together cannot do it. Of course, uncertainty principle is something that sounds very strange because we do not really have that much of uncertainty in the real world and uh, so it gave rise to a lot of uh, well a lot of discussion in fields beyond science when uncertainty principle was proposed in literature in art in cartoons. Lot of people had a lot of fun uh, by making cartoons pointing out what seemed to be the ridiculousness of uncertainty principle. But uh, no matter how much of uh, humor factor it might have provided to the contemporary society the fact remains that until date the understanding is that uncertainty principle is a natural phenomenon, a natural limit that one cannot violate. So, even though Bohr theory is great at giving us many values of physical constants and all, there is no option but to forsake it and move on. And to move on, once again we have to take a step back. Many of us would perhaps know, I mean maybe all of us know that Einstein got his Nobel Prize not for uh, the theory of relativity, but for photoelectric effect. So, what is shown in photoelectric effect, we are not going to go into the detail of it, is that this light behaves like particles. But then throughout 19th century, Huygens and other scientists had performed a large number of experiments which showed the wave nature of light diffraction. Diffraction is a sure shot proof of wave nature interference. So all of us have studied uh, the uh, studied physical optics which is all about wave nature of light. So, is light a wave or is light a particle? Newton said it is particle seeing the results of photoelectric effect Einstein said it is particle, but the wave nature is also manifested. So, it turns out that light has a dual nature. It can be a wave well when uh, can behave as a wave can behave as a particle. So, this duality of light is established in many different ways one people think of photons as a packet of waves and so on and so forth. With this background, uh, there was some thought that can there be a wave nature of matter as well. And the reason for that thought was that actual experiments were performed in which wave nature of matter was established. And those experiments were essentially electron diffraction. Electron diffraction tells us that electrons can have wave nature, but then we already know that electrons have particle nature. So, from the experiments it was suggested that wave particle duality might exist and then uh, we should call it de Broglie's law now. It has been called a hypothesis for too long a time. De Broglie actually proposed that uh, de Broglie uh, worked out the relationship between the wave like properties and particle like properties of these this uh, wave particle uh, of the things that can uh, manifest wave particle duality. 
and that was the beginning of the wave mechanical treatment of what everything is made up of. We will take it up in the next module.